The network BION stands for, let me see if I can do this, Biomimetics Network for Industrial Sustainability. That's and that, that sounds exactly what we need here in Sweden. So we are very curious to hear what you've done in the UK. Welcome. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, <coughs> I'm from the University of Reading. I joined there in 2002 as lecturer in biomimetics. Um, as I guess everybody here comes from a completely bit different background, so do I. I graduated in zoology and I now find myself working in an engineering department. During my time at Reading, I've become increasingly involved with the Biomimetics Network for Industrial Sustainability. And at the moment, I'm one of the members of the management board. So today, I'd like to share some of our experiences in networking, specifically in getting industry buy-in for biomimetics, and also a bit about biomimetics and why I think it's advantageous for industry to take a look at it. Well, the first thing I want to cover is, well, why biomimetics? What has biomimetics got that competing routes to innovation and creativity don't have? It's very important if you're trying to sell a methodology. Ideally, it should be better than existing methodologies. Secondly, what are the outputs of biomimetics? How successful has it been in generating new technologies? Then I'm going to briefly touch on processes of engagement, um, how you can possibly get things right and get people working together. And then finally, a bit of a brief overview of Bionis and what it does. Well, <clears throat> this rather colourful graph um, is resulting from some work carried out by Julian Vincent and his colleagues at the University of Bath. And they were interested in identifying the ways in which technology and nature solved problems. So the vertical axis on this graph represents the percentage of problem resolutions, and the horizontal x-axis represents the size of a structural technology. Now, this is the figure for engineered materials. And as you can see, rather a lot of this graph is red. And the red color represents solutions that are due to manipulating energy. So we can see, for example, at the micron scale, pretty much 70% of all problem resolutions in technology are done by manipulating energy. When we look at the same figure for biology, we find that energy almost disappears. Other things become more important, structure, the way you assemble things, and also information. So really, this starts to hint at one of the uh, most powerful things about biomimetics. If we are attempting to mimic devices found in nature, we may be pretty certain that these devices have evolved in an environment where use of energy is minimized. So this means that bio-inspired technologies may well be cleaner, greener, and more sustainable. So, how would I summarize the differences between nature and technology? Well, we've had life on Earth for well over two billion years, so that's an awful lot of field testing. And thousands of successful solutions to specific um, mechanical or physical problems have evolved as a result. Also, nature tends to manipulate energy far less than technology. Animals and plants are very mean with the way in which they use nature because obviously it takes an awful lot of effort to recover that energy, and it's energy that you might very well be spending doing different things. Also, biology seems to do a lot of clever things with not very many materials. If we consider the world of technology, we're faced with many hundreds or thousands of different types of polymeric materials, composites, metals, ceramics. Whereas in nature, we really find only uh, several, uh, three or four main classes of uh, materials. As I mentioned before, um, biology tends to do things in a clean and green way, so this may improve the sustainability of technologies derived by looking at biology. 
And finally, just to give a couple of examples, if we want to make a ceramic, it involves heating to vast temperatures, lots of noxious chemicals. When nature wants to make a ceramic, for example, when a mollusk produces its shell, it does it in salt water at around 4 degrees centigrade, and it makes its shell from uh, components that it derives from eating algae, for example. Likewise, we all hear about the wonder material Kevlar, which has incredible strength properties. Again, this is an energy-intensive material relying on a lot of chemical inputs. When a spider wants to make spider silk, which has properties that almost rival Kevlar, it eats flies and extrudes silk at room temperature. So there's no noxious waste, no nasty byproducts. Well, what are the outputs of biomimetics? We're perhaps all familiar with seeing some of the headline stories, Lotus Effect, etc. Now, I would argue that biomimetics by its nature has to be an applied discipline. It should be looking towards commercialisable real-world applications. It may be very um, appealing for us academics to produce some nutty device that's based on nature, but it isn't much use to everyone if it spends its whole life stuck on a shelf in a laboratory. So how can we look at commercialisable outputs? There's been quite a wide interest in the business press. For example, here's the cover of The Economist from a couple of years ago, um, where they ran a whole issue of technology quarterly based around biomimetics. So one way of assessing this is to look at patterns of patenting activity. So some research we've done at Reading to look at the growth of biomimetics has involved searching for patents in the US patent and trademark databases that include search terms such as biologically inspired, biomimetic, bionic. So what do we find? <coughs> well, we found that as of 2007, there are quite a lot of patents out there that seem to have some evidence of biomimetics in their creation. Obviously, the people who are filing these patents are spending several tens of thousands of euros um, developing these patents, so they must have some degree of confidence that they're going to make a recovery on that investment. Well, what you can also do is try and engage in a bit of futurology. Um, you may see that there's a black line passing through the cumulative number of biomimetic patents. And this is um, a logistical S-shaped curve. Now, economists have identified that this often tracks the path of new um, uh, innovations. So we can see that we've still got quite a long way to go before activity in biomimetics peaks. Um, unfortunately, it peaks in around 2020, and my retirement date isn't until 2034, so I may have to think of something else to do for the last 14 years of my career. So, what would I argue are the advantages to industry of a biomimetic approach? Well, firstly, I think there's a great amount of underpinning biological and biomechanical research out there. And it just needs a little bit of transfer to move that into technologies. Also, I think one of the advantages for industry is that the approach may provide sustainable solutions to problems that may involve added functionality when compared with traditional engineered approaches. So, we've got clever academics producing biomimetic um, devices, and then we've got a world of industry and business out there. How do we get the two to work together? <laughs>